Hi guys, Claudia Boleyn here and welcome to day 13 of the lockdown vlogs. Um, yes, I'm still here. I'm back on the iPad today, however, because, oh my lord, the other camera has way better picture quality and loads of you commented on it and said it's a really nice picture quality. It is, but the sound quality is awful and no matter what I did to the sound, I couldn't fix it. So we're on the iPad where the sound is quieter, but I'm going to boost it when I edit it and hopefully it'll be all right. So I'm sorry about that. I'm going to sort it out. I'm going to start trying to use a mic and recording the audio separately, um, which I'll have the time to do soon because I got uh, my email last night pretty late at like eight o'clock or something to tell me that my EMA, which is my examination or examiner marked assignment, the final piece of my third year, <laughs> it's cancelled, my friends. <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy about that. I did like a happy dance. I was so, so thrilled because my TMA scores have been pretty good. So there are tutor marked assignments throughout the year and that puts me on track for a first. Um, I've just got to do two more tutor marked assignments. The big one's gone now. So if I can get good grades in that, <laughs> then it's a first for me. <laughs> the rules are starting to get stricter here in the UK because it's a really really hot weekend so people are wanting to go to the parks and to sunbathe and go to the beaches and that that's the light off my phone by the way I don't know if that just like <laughs> lit up the screen and a lot of people are starting to get quite annoyed by that um I get it I do understand I feel very frustrated and I think it's it's difficult especially for people who live in crowded accommodation, maybe they have a big family, maybe they live in a tower block or they don't have a garden. We're lucky because we've got a garden, so, you know, we can go and sit in that. It's only small, but it's it's somewhere, you know, it's going to be much more difficult for other people. So I understand that, um, but a lot of people are taking the mickey with this and they're having barbecues and they're all going out, like, loads of people to the same place. And I understand it's frustrating because, common sense-wise, you would think we would still be able to use parks because people would just think okay we'll distance in the park but that just isn't happening and we all know <laughs> not everyone has common sense and it just takes that one person and more people are infected especially if you're all stopping in a certain area you know that loads of people are going to so I know it's frustrating but it's got to be done the scary thing is that they're actually saying I think it's Matt Hancock was on the news earlier saying if people don't follow the regulations now then it's going to get even harsher and they're going to stop all exercise outside and I just, oh my god, please people, if you're watching this, just please do as you're told, even if you think it sounds silly, because, oh my lord, I need to get out of this house. <laughs> it's like, when you have, like, mental health issues, it's really important to be able to just have a walk. Like, even if it just, like, gets you out of an environment, or, you know, it's part of what I learned in my therapy, is that one of my coping skills is if things get bad, then just go for a walk, go for a short walk. I don't want that taken away, that's very important to me to be able to do that. Um, for the poor people who are living in, you know, people who are living in, in flats and tower blocks and don't have a garden or anything like that, that's their only time they're going to be able to go out other than shopping, so please don't take that away from them. Right, I'm going to answer some questions today because I promised that I would, so let's get to it. Say so Louise asks, uh, what are your favourite Florence songs? That's Florence and the Machine for anyone who doesn't know my all-time favourite band, I just love Florence so much. Um, hmm. Well, my, my favourite song of all time ever, I have I have two, but one is a pop song, pop song, indie, and one is a classical piece of music. So my pop song is Rabbit Heart, Raise It Up by Florence and the Machine, it's my all-time favourite song. And the classical music I really love is This Is Gallifrey, Our Childhood, Our Home by Murray Gold, and they are my top two favourite pieces of music ever. Um, Cosmic Love is very uh, meaningful to me, I especially love that one. Um, I think Seven Devils is very special to me. I think I'm going to say Blinding, I'm going to say Howl, I mean, I, <laughs> I might as well just say the entire Lungs album. Oh, and Breath of Life. Breath of Life is, is really spectacular, in my opinion, so I think those are probably, I think those are probably my favourites. I don't know, there's bound to be more that I've forgotten, but just off the top of my head, they're the ones that I'm thinking of. Wave says, in reference to what I said about drinking before, that's the exact same reason as to why I don't drink either. Sober for life, high five. High fiving you through the screen. But don't make actual contact because of the virus. <laughs> Just do an air one. Okay, Dodo isn't dead. Again, sorry if I'm repeating some people's questions and um, I'm not deliberately ignoring anyone. I'm just answering the questions that are easiest to answer and that I feel in the mood to answer. Sometimes some of the deeper questions um, I'm not ignoring, I just am thinking, hmm, maybe when I'm in a different brain space I'll answer that one. So 
I haven't necessarily thought, oh, I'm not answering certain questions. It's just the ones that have popped out at me and I've thought, oh, I want to answer that one. So Dodo Isn't Dead says, I've been playing a lot of Sims lately. Do you ever play Sims? If so, which game is your favourite? I have played Sims, yes. Um, <laughs> I bought it about two years ago. I don't know what type it is. I didn't even know there were different types of Sims. I just got it because... I, I'm going to be honest why well, I got it. <laughs> because I wanted to make... Robert and Aaron and Liv and the Emmerdale village and I wanted to make Victoria and I wanted to make the Emmerdale characters and put them in a village <laughs> and I put Aaron and Robert in a house with Liv and I, I, my plan was that they were going to adopt a child somehow but the thing is with Sims is that I kind of lose interest and they're probably dead now <laughs> I haven't been feeding them or anything, they're probably dead. When I was younger, my friend Chloe had Sims on her laptop, so whenever I used to go round there, like, she always had stuff before we had it in our house, so I was so awful. Whenever we used to go around there, I was, like, so excited, like, because they had internet, like, broadband, and we were, we didn't have it for ages, and then we were only allowed 30 minutes a night or something, but Chloe just had, like, broadband whenever she wanted it, so I used to, like... <laughs> make her sit there with me and watch Bradley James videos because at the time Bradley James was my my crush um I I didn't realize I when I was into Merlin as well the character I was actually most obsessed with was actually Morgana right but I didn't realize that I was bisexual then or I hadn't really accepted it I didn't really get it so I remember even when I met Bradley James and Colin Morgan once because my friend Chloe again took me to a signing at Lakeside um and we got asked like on a on a like a questionnaire thing like who was your favorite merlin character and mine was morgana um and it had only been like it was only i'm sure merlin had only been on for like two series or something by then so that was an unusual thing um i was doing art of morgana and making videos of morgana i mean clearly my favorite was morgana <laughs> but i thought it was arthur but yeah i did really like bradley james anyway why am i talking about that um so we also had we had sims at her house and um we used to, <laughs> I made me, and I'm pretty pretty sure that we made Bradley James, and I think we had a child. I'm not sure if we had a child. I don't know, I can't remember, but we forgot about that, and, and the whole, but we're probably all dead there too. Sarah A says, as a writer, do you find yourself struggling to choose names for your characters? How do you choose names for your characters, and do you think a character's name can sometimes influence the way you write them? I come up with a character before I come up with the name always, so I just know the feeling and the vibe of a character. The other day I was writing a script um, and I knew the vibe of the character. I knew them inside out. I knew what they'd say. I knew a lot about them. But the name, oh, I have a, a book of baby names and sometimes I just go through it and I just look for the right, sometimes it's just a sound or like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like an instinct where I find the right name and it bugs me if I don't have a name. So often I will use place names. So if I haven't decided yet, I will use a name for someone in a script, but I'll know deep down that that name is not their actual name. It's just a name while I decide on their true name. I'm quite into name meanings as well. I mean, that's not my first reason why I would pick something, but I do like it if a name meaning is kind of linked to a character in some way. Lisa Newman asked, I was wondering long term, have you found the steps therapy helped? I also did the course as I have BPD. I went to uni halfway through and got the sheets, but I don't know if I've had a real benefit from it because of this. I found your videos really helped catch up on the things I missed. Would you consider finishing the series? No pressure. I really appreciate how difficult it can be with BPD to get all the things done that you have to and you're doing so well. Thank you, Lisa. Um, so first of all, have I found that it helped? Yes, I have found that it helped hugely. Um, to be honest it started helping me from like the second or third week um you have to kind of commit to it and it's painful while you're doing it because while you're actually doing it you might feel like you're getting worse because you're unearthing some things and that can be really difficult but in the long run i've kind of learned so many coping mechanisms that they come automatically they kind of drilled them into me so i kind of start doing them now without realizing i also know that i am not like the problem which is helpful because it helps stops you from like you know hating yourself so much because you kind of understand your illness when you start to understand what your illness makes you think and 
the way your illness makes you feel and the way in which you can be understood and the way in which people around you might mean well but misunderstand you that's really helpful as well because sometimes you can feel like the people around you like don't deal with it particularly well but that's also not their fault like they don't get the illness particularly i think the the biggest uh, good thing about the group was the fact that it was a group the fact that everyone had the same disorder so although we kind of expressed it differently um, and we were all very different people it's just nice to be able to talk about things that even with your closest family and friends you could talk about and they would be really freaked out about like especially things like suicidal ideation because um people don't tend to realize that like to someone with bpd that's really normal and just always sort of there so if you were to start talking about like the suicidal feelings and stuff people might freak out and think oh no like are they going to attempt it or something or you know are they really ill but other people get that that who have it get that that's just always sort of there so it's not like a shocking thing and it's quite nice to be able to have dark humor in those sessions and be able to laugh about it because it's the sort of things that you just couldn't <laughs> you couldn't really laugh about it with people who haven't really experienced that kind of thing yes i do want to finish the series um i'm hopefully going to do it once my tmas are in i think because um I stopped doing it because my course got really intense um, and then I was in a good mental space for it and you don't really want to be making videos like that if you're not in a good mental space because that's not helpful to people watching it. So um, yeah, maybe in about four or five weeks I'll record. I think there's only three left to go. I've got all my paperwork and everything so I will make those videos. Charlotte Hubert asked, Hi Claudia, I was just wondering if you'd seen Joker and if so, what are your thoughts on it? I watched it for the first time last night and while there were some aspects of it that I thought were well done, namely the struggles the Joker faced as a mentally ill person navigating a society that didn't accommodate him, the overall narrative of mental illness leading to violence was one I found deeply troubling, and I was quite shaken after finishing the film. I'd love to hear your opinion on it. Um, hmm. So the thing with Joker is when I was going in, there was a lot of controversy around it, like before I saw it. I didn't see it in the cinema because I wasn't well enough to see it in the cinema. Um, so I had to wait for it to be online and for Dan to show it to me. Um, a lot of people were saying, oh, it's going to cause, you know, um, shootings and murder and that sort of thing. They were saying it was like an incel film. So I was expecting going into it that it was going to be really like way pro Joker, our hero. Like, let's take his perspective on everything. When I saw it, it wasn't as radical as <laughs> the, um, the critiques I'd read made me think it was you know um a lot of people as well saying that it was like really groundbreaking cinema and i i didn't think it was groundbreaking cinema either i thought it was a good film i thought it was incredibly well acted um i think that it was you know it was very emotional and if a film makes me feel then i tend to like it um it was quite creative i don't like that all the superhero films kind of follow the same mold at the moment so i like that it took its own sort of style and that it's a one-off and that it's a bit more serious my granddad watched it uh, recently with dan and granddad liked it so <laughs> you don't have to be into superhero stuff to enjoy it as for the portrayal of mental illness i'm kind of similar to you because i think that i liked how they highlighted the way that you get lost in the system that you're asked to apply for help but the people that are supposedly helping you aren't really being paid enough themselves and they don't really care and we're in a society where people can be really cruel. And I kind of like that in Arthur's story, it's not necessarily his illness which creates the trouble. It is the lack of, um, of understanding from people and basic kindness from people. I like the way it pointed out that we like to laugh at mentally ill people. For example, you know, using the clip of him on the comedy show broke my heart it reminded me a bit of x factor auditions and um, the jeremy kyle show where you see people who are vulnerable and unwell and they're they're just basically made into figures of ridicule yes i i don't like the fact that the idea is that mental illness causes violence and that's something that i find quite difficult with a lot of films um especially as well when it comes to personality disorders because in film usually that means oh dangerous sort of thing so I, I really would hate for people to come away from that film thinking oh it was because of his illness i don't know i think it's more the concern around that film for me is actually more the people watching the film than the film itself i'd say the film itself is not that dodgy um 
I don't think it's particularly pro Joker. I think it makes you pity him to a point before he goes completely over the edge. And then you just think, oh my lord, how has this happened? How has this spiralled? I don't think they presented him as a hero. And I think they they never presented him as cool. You know, my worry that it was going to be like, oh, look at him. Like, the system failed him, so he decided to just, like, turn against everyone. And how cool is he? It, it didn't feel like that. The, the tone I got from the film was a sort of spiralling sense of horror and, oh no, what's happening? Like, <laughs> someone stop it. It's like a runaway train and well now we've got a problem i mean the people <laughs> the people who came out of that film and were like joker was right like yeah i joined joker like he was the hero of the film worry me because i kind of think were you watching the same film i was <laughs> like you can simultaneously feel sorry for him as a person and pity the path that got him to the state he's in without thinking that yay like it was <laughs> it was him finally hissing back at the system by hurting more people somehow because that helps. I'm moving back again. I've got shorts on. Don't, that looks like I've just got bare legs, but I have got shorts on. I feel like I do have more thoughts on Joker that could be <laughs> more articulate than that. But um, yeah, I uh, maybe that's for another video. I'd like to make a video about the portrayal of mental illness in media in general, like current media. Um, and that would be an interesting study for it. Elias, or Elias, said, sorry if I've pronounced that wrong, it's odd to me that Corbyn supporters are calling people centrist as an insult, one of those pot, one of those pot meat kettle situations. Corbyn is not on the left. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I, I do get what you're saying, because in terms of global politics and socialism in other countries, um, Corbyn's socialism is, it's, it's kind of central in that respect, you know, it's, it's still quite safe, there's more they could push for and they don't. So even though in this country it's considered to be super radical, it's it's not radical for other certain other countries. But I think um, the reason people would say uh, centrist in this context is more within the politics of this country. So where our political spectrum is here, um, I think that's where the centrist thing comes from and that's why people might, rightly or wrongly, call someone like Keir Starmer a centrist. Um, I'd say Lib Dems are kind of centrist. Just the centre of the political spectrum in this country. But yes, I do get your point. And it is absolutely wild that people in this country consider Corbyn to be like radical, like a radical communist. <laughs> no, really, if you look at other countries, it's not that radical. It's just socialism. It's just socialism. And it could be much more progressive in fact. Okay, Jesse Rosie asked, I would love to know what your writing process is like, if you have a routine, how you deal with writer's block, how you keep yourself inspired. I'm really loving your quarantine vlogs and I hope you're doing well. Thank you, I hope you're doing well as well. Um, my writing process, do I have a routine? No, not really. It depends on, because of the BPD, um, I get spikes of like creativity so I might get days where I'm just constantly writing all the time and it's all I think about. Remember when I novelised The Cursed Child during a summer? That was that was one of those weird times where I, <laughs> I just was obsessed and just constantly writing every day and I was putting up like a chapter a day you know like writing it like transforming it from the play to a novel format but doing that and editing it and putting it up every single day I was getting that done. Um, other days I just write when I feel like it. Um, it's very much about how inspired I feel. So I have been writing an Emmerdale fanfic since, I'm sure I started in 2017, but it's kind of been coming out in bursts. So I did a large portion of it, took a break, did another portion of it, took another break, um, and I hopefully will get the rest of that done uh, when my course is finished. But the inspiration for that, for anyone who is reading that, I don't know how many of you guys are Emmerdale <laughs> fan fiction readers, it's a niche crew. Um, but yeah, I found like my actual enthusiasm for the show itself died, um, which then killed my creativity. So I know I'm going to have to go back and rewatch The Good Eras before I can start writing it again. I make playlists for my characters um, all the time or for a certain project. I like to have music on while I'm writing. Um, I don't like to be disturbed, so... I put my headphones in, I find it very distracting because when I'm writing, like my whole head, especially if it's fiction, my whole brain is, is in like another place and in another situation and taking on all these different voices and I don't like to be distracted by the voices and the world that I'm in while I'm sitting there writing it. 
So um, that's something that's weird during quarantine because I'm not on my own in the house. So it, it's just, I don't know, it feels weird. I do try to write a little bit every day though. I mean, I do that anyway. I'm always writing little bits of fiction and I've got a notepad. I've got so many notepads. That is all my notepads up there. I've got more here. I've got notepads everywhere. Okay, Cecile Henneberg said, um, Hi Claudia, any advice on dealing with loss? My cat was put down today. He has been my best friend for the past 15 years. And what's kept me alive when my suicidal thoughts have been bad? I'm so sad and I miss him terribly. I'm really sorry to hear that, Cecile. That's, that's really terrible. Um, I haven't experienced the loss of a pet personally because I've never had a pet. Um, I am desperate to have a cat, <laughs> but I don't have one. Um, the closest I can think of in terms of that is um, we had a cat that lived next door, a next door's cat, which in her older life, her name was Tabor, and um, she was a very elderly cat and she started to lose her sight and her hearing, but I would feed her like little bits of turkey and sit with her and in the summer before she died, like I would sit outside with her and she'd sit on my lap and it was just so, so nice. And when she, the next door came and told me that, you know, um, she was going to be put down, I was really upset. <laughs> that wasn't even my cat. Because um, I, kn I know how it feels to have that support because I feel like I kind of, it wasn't even my cat, but she was good for me when my mental health was bad. I, I can't imagine how that must feel if you've, you know, had your cat for 15 years. All I can say is that if your cat has been put down, then it sounds like it was for the best because you don't want you don't want something or someone you love to be in pain. I think that would be the worst thing. So you just have to remember that the right thing was done for somebody that you really, really cared about and it was the kindest thing to do. And I know it sounds really silly, but your cat was obviously your friend and helped you through feeling suicidal. And I don't think your cat would want you to to get worse mentally over it. Like It sounds like they were a real support to you. So. It's terribly, terribly sad that they're gone, but you need to, you know, to stay stay where you are and, and keep your head high and keep going and um, maybe find another strategy for keeping calm when you feel suicidal. And I think you should maybe try and feel, I know it's probably very raw, but try and feel grateful and happy that you had that experience, you know, that you did know that creature and that they were your friend and you had that connection. Um, I believe that there are real connections between animals and humans. I feel like they pick up emotions that humans don't sometimes. I mean, my dad's old cat, he's got a new cat now, but his old cat was called Smudge. And he told me that he, when he was sad, the cat would just know and come and sit at his feet and would just know when he was upset. Without him saying anything, the cat would just come to him. So I think animals know. I'm so, so sorry for your loss and um, just... Be grateful for those 15 years and think about how lucky you were to have had those 15 years and for that experience and to have known your lovely cat. Okay, I'm gonna go guys because it is sweltering hot in here and I wish I was not wearing a blouse now. It's too hot. I will see you tomorrow for another video. Keep safe. Um, if you're trying to just follow the rules wherever you are from in terms of, you know, isolation because we want this to go quicker. Um, <laughs> We want to be out of isolation soon, right? So if everyone follows the rules, we can be out of this because it's going to drag on for so long and... Oh, I just want it to end now. Anyway, love you loads and I'll see you really soon. Bye!